I am discussing today the origin and the course of corticospinal tract and the effect of their lesions. Here in this picture, I have shown the corticospinal tracts, which I would be explaining uh, in due course of my discussion. As discussed in my previous class, the voluntary muscle contraction or voluntary movement begins with an idea. Idea in turn is originated from the prefrontal cortex and association areas, and then it will be converted as a command, and that will be coming to the cortical association areas. And this from cortical association areas, it is given to the premotor cortex. Of course, it would take the, it will consult the basal ganglia and lateral cerebellum, which also project onto the premotor cortex. And from the premotor cortex and the motor cortex, the impulse is the reach to the spinal cord. This is the path, this is the corticospinal tract. From the premotor and motor cortex, the impulse is reached to the spinal cord. And uh, uh, the, what we saw yesterday, there, are, uh, there is a movement, and in this movement, uh, through the spinal cord, it is being monitored, uh, monitored either through the cerebellar system or through the premotor system. Okay, now what we are doing, we are trying to concentrate on this aspect, this uh, premotor cortex, uh, to the pathway reaching to the spinal cord. This is a corticospinal tract. A brief organization or a general organization of the corticospinal tract in the brain and various uh, sites is shown here. These are the corti cortex. This is a uh, cerebral cortex. The various parts, the motor, motor cortex, motor part, these are the motor parts of the cerebral cortex. That is the, the primary motor area, pre-motor area and supplementary motor area and uh, uh, somatosensory area one and the somatosensory association area. Now, this is where the, the from these areas, this is the motor cortex, the, the fibers originate. And these fibers descend descend or pass through the internal capsule. This is internal capsule here. This is a thalamus, this is a caudate nucleus, this is globus pallidus, and this is putamen. This forms this uh, uh, narrow lane, pass through this narrow lane that is internal capsule. And from the internal capsule, they reach the medulla, or the med and they form the medullary pyramid because of the, the fibers which uh, descend down, and they will come. At the medulla, the fibers cross to the, 85% of the fibers cross to the opposite side, opposite side, and they descend as a lateral corticospinal tract. Remaining 15% descend to the spinal cord and relay at the various segments that would be as a, a anterior corticospinal tract or ventral corticospinal tract. Okay, so this is the plan of arrangement. That means the start from the cort motor cortex, pass through the internal capsule, reach the medulla, and in the medullary pyramid, they would cross, decussate to the opposite side, 85% of the fibers, that becomes a lateral tract. And uh, the remaining one will be the ventral. Okay, so now, the, the areas I have mentioned, 30% of the fibers are coming from the premotor cortex, uh, and 30% from the primary motor area, remaining 40% from the uh, somatosensory association area. Now from here, this is the alpha motor neuron. This alpha motor neuron is reaching to the muscle. Muscles are here, green one are the upper extremity, the red one are the lower extremity, arms and hands and legs. Okay, this is general organization of the, the uh, corticospinal tract. Now, the, these are the longest tracts, 
say for example from the brain to the sacral level you can see you have those fibers that means the length of those fibers or axons are very very long now uh, we we try to understand this corticospinal tract a little more now where these corticospinal tracts begin or uh, the beginning of the corticospinal tract now i am taking back you to the the cerebral cortical organization cellular organization just to revise you the cerebral cortex is divided into or is uh, divided into six layers layers the out this is the out from outside to inside and there are six layers the first one is the outer molecular layer the external granular layer this is external granular layer the external pyramidal layer the inner granular layer mind you inner granular layer is the sensory area which receives the sensory inputs from the thalamus then we have the inner inner pyramidal area inner pyramidal area is the area for this corticospinal tract so these are the pyramidal cells then the fusiform layer now this inner pyramidal layer hosts very large jain what are called a jain pyramidal cells of the order of 100 micrometers in size they are big cells and these cells present in the layer 5 of the cerebral cortex and they give a dendritic arborization apically this is apical dendritic arborizations and uh, the basal basal dendritic arborizations and these are for they they will the dendritic arborizations are sent to the all the layers now the axons of these cells axons of these cells descend as corticobulbar or corticospinal tract so they they form the the base of this corticospinal tract okay so then their function is motor to the or a motor efferents to the motor neurons of the the brain 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 stem and uh, the spinal cord alpha motor neurons uh, either a trigeminal component or any other uh, uh, muscle component cranial nerve component uh, cranial motor neurons are the spinal motor neurons that is the this thing so that means again Uh, just to say that they are originating from the joint pyramidal cells and the axons of the joint pyramidal cell descend as corticospinal tract now they are also called as a pyramidal tract not because they are originating from this uh, pyramidal cells because uh, these cells are uh, because it is taking origin from different different uh, areas of the brain but because it forms a pyramid in the medulla that is why it is called a pyramidal tract okay so now uh, which are the parts of the cerebral cortex which are involved in the formation of this uh, joint uh, or the corticospinal tract what are the areas of the uh, cerebral cortex these are two hemispheres this is one hemisphere and this is the other hemisphere the other one on the back side we have the areas areas here this four area four is the precentral uh, gyrus precentral gyrus uh, anterior the precentral gyrus this this hatched area is the primary motor area this is known as m1 or a motor cortex so then we have areas here just anterior to it these are supplementary motor area supplementary motor area here on the uh, the superior surface and the premotor area here on the lateral surface of the hemisphere that is area number 6 the area 4 broadman area 4 is the primary motor area that is where it is originating and this primary motor area uh, gives uh, the 30% of the fibers 30% of the fibers of the corticospinal tract then this premotor area 
and uh, supplementary motor area, the pre-motor area and supplementary motor area, that is uh, area six primarily and area eight. Uh, these are uh, uh, frontal eye field areas. Area six and eight, they contribute about 30% of the fibers. 30% from M1, area four, 30% from area six and eight. Then remaining 40% comes from this somatosensory association area. This is somatosensory association area, S1, uh, S1, and, and this uh, association area, somatosensory association area, that is a parietal association area, five and seven. So that means uh, we have a, a somatosensory area and the posterior parietal area, they contribute about 40%. The primary or S1 contributes 25%. The posterior parietal cortex, that is somatosensory association area, that contributes about 15%. That is the breakup of the fibers. The 15% from here, 25% from here, 30 from here, and um, uh, 30 from here. That makes the 100% of these fibers. So they they all uh, they all converge. That is what the coronal radiator, coronal radiator. All these things are. Uh, the, they, they just descend down and enter into the uh, internal capsule. So now, the representation, homunculus, homunculus of the uh, representation of the muscles is as here. You just look here. Uh, on the inside, you have this inside, you have a toes, uh, ankle, ankle here. This is the representation of the ankle. This is the knee joint. For, for the motion of the knee joint. This is the hip joint and the trunk and the shoulder, uh, shoulder, shoulder joint and the elbow joint, the wrist joint. So now you just see these joints, especially the trunk and the hip and the uh, some shoulder, trunk and the hip, they have a very little space, uh, little representation. So now, hand, you see, this is a large amount of representation. That means our hand muscles, uh, we use our hand uh, for all the manipulations, uh, tools, and uh, other things. Uh, These hand muscles are uh, having a greater representation. Now, again, the fingers, uh, mu mu fing muscles of the finger, they have a greater representation. So that is why we are able to uh, do a pinpointed action by the fingers. Uh, uh, you see, you have a very tiny little uh, um, mobile phones or even uh, uh, some watches having those things. And you, you do the manipulation. So that is uh, the representation of these fingers. And you have the face, the very large area, very large area. And the eyes, eye, eyeball muscles, especially the movement of the eyes, they will have a greater representation. The face will have a greater representation. The vocal cord, because vocal cord is a highly organized uh, uh, muscle, and their actions produce the speech, that is the speech production. And this is highly represented here because our speech has a definite, uh, uh, definite uh, parameters. So all those things could be monitored. So there is greater presentation. So then uh, we have uh, other representations of for the jaw and the tongue and the swallowing muscles, muscles of the swallowing. This is the representation of the muscles. Again, uh, same thing holds true as it holds true for the sensory homunculus. Representation is proportional uh, to the skillful action of the muscle or a precision of the muscle. This is more precise. These hand muscles are more precise. This then, then comes other joint movements. Okay, that is the homunculus of this thing. From here, so now uh, one more aspect uh, before uh, they, we have been, we have seen that it is originating from one primary, primary cortex M1, the premotor and supplementary motor area. So then we have the somatosensory area S1 and uh, the uh, postoperatal area. Now, what are their contribution? So you look at that and the primary motor cortex provides the precise action on group of muscles. 
distal muscles distal muscles means the muscles of action the muscles which perform the motion the axial muscles or the proximal muscles or the muscles for maintenance of the posture and equilibrium so now they will these primary motor cortex m1 provides a precise they that would perform the precise action the premotor cortex and the parietal cortex premotor cortex and the parietal cortex uh, premotor cortex is a broad main area 6 and 8 parietal cortex is a, a 5 and 7 so these areas uh, they are they are for the uh, posture for setting the posture they get the inputs the proprioceptive inputs and from the proprioceptive inputs they will project on to the proximal muscles that means uh, for those muscles which are maintaining the posture and equilibrium this is for action this is for a uh, posture then supplementary motor cortex this would give it is a sort of the planning the action planning the planning uh, component it gives a broad range or a vague range of activity to groups of muscles say for example if i have to uh, lift a cup so that means there are groups of muscles so that means one here in the uh, triceps uh, shoulder joints and the neck muscles and the uh, so many muscles are involved so this entire planning entire plan of the particular action including the proximal or the uh, posture regulating muscles now the posterior parietal cortex the area 5 it provides uh, the information for aiming and the manipulation so that means uh, you are thinking you are trying to hit the stumps so that is coming from the area 5 of the posterior cortex then area 7 hand eye coordination that means it provides uh, the hand and the eye coordination that is that is our uh, the uh, focusing of the visual field with uh, actions by the hand the area 8 the 468 8 is the frontal eye fields this is the eyeball movement so execution of a learned movement such as the use of tools using fork in eating that is done by area 7 especially the posterior parietal cortex it's, you just see that uh, the using fork for eating or uh, chopsticks you know if you want to go to the uh, japan or china you they will provide you the chopstick and they eat everything with the chopstick and they, it is so marvelous to see that uh, such a type of uh, uh, use of tools is by the uh, posterior parietal cortex okay the primary motor cortex for a group of muscles of the distal muscles the premotor and parietal cortex for uh, the posture supplementary motor cortex for a group of muscles, the posterior cortex for aiming and manipulation and coordination. Now, so this is uh, where the fibers originate. You just see that. Uh, you just see the origin, the fanning out to see all these uh, these things. This is corona radiator. So these uh, these are originating from uh, different areas of the brain. So I have already mentioned M1 is 30% pre-motor and supplementary motor area 30% and 40% uh, from the somatosensory area and uh, the posterior parietal area 40%, 40, 30, 30, 100%. The total number of fibers, total number of these fibers are 1,000, 1,000. How much it is? Ten lakh, more than ten lakh fibers, more than one million fibers. Ten lakh, more than ten lakh fibers, and of that fibers, fifty-five percent are distributing to the head and neck region. So that means the importance of the head and neck, especially the vocal cords, head and neck regions. Twenty-five percent of the thoracic cervical thoracic region, cervical thoracic region. So that means uh, the limb upper extremities, the 25%. That means uh, the hand movement. The 20% for the remaining lumbosacral segments, lumbosacral segments that are lower extremity. So we have about uh, 1 million or 10 lakh fibers. And of that, that is the distribution. Now, 
Let us come back. These fibers pass through this uh, the narrow lane. This is internal capsule. This is internal capsule. They descend down. They, they descend down to the medulla here. They form the uh, pyramid. And then they decussate. They 85% of the fibers, they will uh, cross to the opposite side and cross to the opposite side and uh, they will descend as a lateral corticospinal tract. And then they supply the various segments or the motor neurons of the various segments of the uh, spinal cord. This is a lateral corticospinal tract. Then 15%, nearly 15 to 20% of them, they do not cross. They descend to the spinal cord and at the segmental level, they cross or they give, uh, they cross on uh, collaterals to the opposite side. So that means uh, they will uh, uh, not only cross, they will have a corresponding parallel connections with the, both the sides of the um, uh, limb, so our segment. So that is the anterior corticospinal tract. Let us uh, uh, see about uh, these things. Uh, look at that. Uh, uh, you, you just see that this is how the fibers come. You just see that fibers coming here. This is the uh, internal capsule. They are coming here. And this is the internal capsule. This is internal capsule. This, this narrow lane, narrow ring, uh, whatever this thing, this is the internal capsule. is uh, The internal capsule is made up of, uh, uh, what is this, thalamus? The caudate nucleus, this globus pallidus, uh, putamen. These are parts of the uh, lentiform nucleus. That is the basal ganglia. This is also a part of the basal ganglia, and this is thalamus. And all these fibers, they, they, this is coronaradiator fibers. They just uh, uh, come in this narrow lane. Why we are interested in this narrow lane? Because this narrow lane is uh, subject to the cerebrovascular accidents. So whenever there is a hemorrhage or a stroke, what we call as a stroke, so these fibers get involved. So look here, in a very narrow range, we have all the fibers coming from the all parts of the brain or all parts of the motor cortex are uh, there. So that is the, the, this thing. And uh, you see here, this is uh, the pattern of uh, uh, the a distribution of the various uh, in terms of the homunculus, uh, starting from a tongues, the eye field, the thumb, fingers, wrist, elbow, and shoulder. Then we have these uh, toes coming in the in, inside inside the cortex. That means here, here in the interior of the uh, central sulcus. So now this is the distribution. This is how the various uh, uh, cut cortical fibers so they are concentrated in the internal capsule okay so now just i am trying to show you the anatomical features of these uh, this is what the the corona radiator so corona radiator is this this is a corona radiator and uh, uh, this is a, a real anatomical features and they will just descend down this is here it is, it is the internal capsule this is structure uh, is uh, it's been obstructing here? This is central capsule. They descend down uh, in the cerebral peduncle here. They descend down. Uh, it comes here. It 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 makes a pyramid. Or it is a pyramid here. So this is uh, uh, what you see here. These are lateral ventricles. Then uh, we have the thalamus there, and this is the part of the internal capsule internal capsule, and then uh, descending, and this way makes the pyramid. So now, so this is just looking at the internal capsule because uh, this will be a very uh, important aspect. That is why the internal capsule is made up of the structures, thalamus. This is a put, this is the basal lentiform nucleus. That is the globus pallidus and the putamen. And this here is the uh, head of the caudate nucleus. You have the V-shaped, knee-shaped, knee almost knee, knee joint. You just see that. This is the genu or the bend of the knee. So this is the V-shaped or inverted V-shaped or a genu-shaped uh, area. This is a white, this contains the white matters or the fibers coming. And uh, here in this part, this is, the, this is the anterior limb and this is the posterior limb. And in the posterior limb, these are distributed. And here is the uh, thoracic lumbar and the uh, 
the upper uh, extremity. This, this is the distribution distribution of the fibers of the corticospinal tract. And uh, these are corticobulbar fibers. That is, these are fibers uh, which are uh, governing with the, the cranial nerve uh, motor component. The same thing I have just done with the sagittal section. Uh, sagittal section, you have this, uh, this uh, particular part. This is the particular part which are interested for the cortico. Uh, corticospinal tract. So if you are looking at that, this is corticospinal tract, corticonuclear, nuclear, uh, uh, that is for the upper limb, and a corticonuclear for the head and neck. You just see that. Uh, and uh, this is the inter genu of the internal capsule, that is a bend of the internal capsule. This is the, in this is the anterior component, and this is posterior component. This is in brief about uh, uh, providing the idea about the internal capsule. Internal capsule is the area containing the fibers descending from the descending and ascending uh, descending from the cortex downwards ascending from thalamus upwards to the cortical area so this this component anterior component is the ascending fibers and the posterior component is the descending fibers here this is a corticospinal or the going downwards corticobulbar or corticospinal and these are uh, uh, thalamocortical projections. Thalamocortical means going up. Some of them uh, are interconnected. So those are uh, different. So you can just see all, all of them. Maybe uh, I would not. Uh, I would not go into the details, and uh, maybe maybe we will be studying them in anatomy in a greater detail. But uh, for curiosity's sake, uh, this compound anterior part is for the ascending fibers mostly, and uh, the posterior part is for the descending, that is a corticospinal tract. And the arrangement is uh, the limbs, thorax, and the arm, something like that. Now, coming back here, we have this uh, coronary radiata, and then uh, internal capsule descends down. The anterior corticospin, they, they come to the, the medulla, here in the medulla. So these are the areas. When they come to the medulla, these are the areas. You just see that this area, this area forms the pyramid. Can you see that pyramid? Pyramid is a um, something like these uh, fibers projecting, projecting on. They make a pyramidal structure. If I make a transverse section, you see the typical pyramid. But here, this would come as a projection. You can just see that. This is the projection here. These are the bundles of fibers which are descending down. And somewhere here, they decussate. They will cross to the opposite side. They will merge and cross to the opposite side. These are the pyramids. And that is why they are also known as a pyramidal tracks. Pyramidal tracks. Um, Maybe, so this is the real picture wherein you see this pyramid. This is a pyramid. This is one pyramid. Medulla oblongata, this is one pyramid. This is another pyramid. And this is the olive. Same thing what I am trying to show here. The top is the, the pawns and the, uh, you get the cerebellum on either side. So now, uh, if maybe I would like to show you the another uh, interesting uh, picture uh, which you may be interested to uh, see. See here. So this is one of those uh, uh, beautiful pictures. I will just uh, show you. This is in uh, Healthline. Maybe uh, this is in different uh, layers. Uh, here I am just trying to reduce the layer, and I will just come back. Okay. So this is where this uh, the this is cerebellum. This is cerebellum side, and this is the the medulla oblongata. If I enlarge, you, you just see that. You just see. See th these are the pyramids. These are the pyramids. So you will just see that this this is one pyramid, then this is another pyramid. Maybe if I if I if I bring it down, so you just just look at that. How how that uh, particular uh, things are uh, prominent. Uh, this this makes the pyramid, uh, and uh, maybe I can rotate. Uh, this is the dorsal side. This is the ventral side, uh, and this uh, that means the pyramid is it's something like a, a range of. Uh, Himalayan range or the mountain ranges, uh, mountain ranges. Uh, so what we see in the, uh, maybe I will just uh, enlarge. Uh, 
bring it down here. Uh, it has gone out of focus. The focus, okay. Now, so if this this is the thing uh, I can rotate on, this is the ventral side and this is the dorsal side. On the dorsal side, we have these um, pyramids. These are the uh, cortic, these, are, these forms the pyramidal tract or corticospinal tract. Somewhere here, uh, they will, uh, they, they will uh, decussate. Okay. Uh, if if I take the layer off uh, with this, uh, I think it is one of those uh, beautiful, uh, beautiful uh, uh, site wherein you can see the study the anatomy. This is one of the uh, the female uh, body. Female body. They were trying to show you can see the three dimensional aspect and you can hit at the particular uh, uh, thing uh, maybe you can uh, you can uh, just uh, remove layer by layer you can remove layer by layer and study uh, maybe i would like uh, that you should you go with this uh, site whenever you want to see uh, human body nervous system i have just said pyramid you can see that healthline.com human body maybe it will be very useful when you are uh, studying with your anatomy but uh, uh, i had shown here the what pyramid is okay uh, coming back coming back with my presentation with my presentation here uh, in the current so this is what uh, the pyramid this is a real thing and then these are these are the pyramids it makes and now uh, the same thing I'm just making you have this uh, lentiform nucleus that's the globus pallidus and the internal capsule and I have shown what happens in pyramid and then crossing crossed fibers are known as a lateral corticospinal tract, uncrossed fibers, uh, the anterior corticospinal tract. And again, I have made head and neck regions, 55%, um, uh, thoracic, 25%, lumbosacral, 15, 20, 20%. Now, so this is the, in the spinal cord, when they descend up, this is the lateral corticospinal tract because it is in there in the lateral area, lateral area in the spinal cord. That is why it is lateral corticospinal tract. In the, this is the ventral spinal, corticospinal tract, ventral corticospinal tract. This is, a, um, and these are crossed. Actually, this one is coming from the opposite side. This is uncrossed. This is a crossed. This is uncrossed. So other side is the uh, ascending tracts so I have already uh, described. Now, so these are the these are the corticospinal tract to originate from the motor cortex, descends through the internal capsule, reach the medulla, form the pyramid, cross to the opposite side, eighty-five percent. And they are known as a lateral corticospinal tract and supply the distal muscles are the muscles of action. And the remaining 15% of the fibers, they will descend to the particular segment. You just see that it is descending here to the particular segment and they will form uh, through the interneuron, uh, they will connect to the, these things. And these are anterior or a ventral corticospinal tract. And these are for action precise moment these are for posture and equilibrium okay so this is a, a lower limb the red one is for the lower limb and the green one for the upper limb you can just see that and uh, this is a, a crossed fiber this is a uncrossed fiber they will come to the segmental level same level but it is through the interneuron it will interact and this is the uh, this will go to the uh, muscle here, the muscles of the hand and arms, the muscles of the legs and feet. Now, uh, these are the, then what happens uh, if uh, the corticospinal tracts are uh, interrupted? If 
there is an interruption of the corticospinal tract at the at the most likely uh, site is the internal capsule because that is the most vulnerable narrow lane narrow lane and when they are uh, damaged they will produce a upper motor neuron lesion what is called upper motor neuron lesion so now we have in the upper motor neurons there are pyramidal neurons and extra pyramidal neurons the pyramidal neurons are the one which we were trying to talk about which are, are the motor uh, neurons of layer 5 of the various areas extra pyramidal neurons are coming either coming from the uh, the brain stem reticular system brain stem and reticular system the pontopeduncular nucleus which are receiving inputs from the the basal ganglia and other uh, other sources the even the vestibular system the reticular system the um, uh, red, red nucleus a rubrospinal tract these are extra pyramidal so the the here they produce upper motor neuron lesion and uh, after injury, because injury has to subside, the, there will be a particular pattern of a motor deficiency and symptoms appear. What is that pattern? They will have a spasticity and a class fly positivity. One point number one, the lesions of the corticospinal tract, they produce the spasticity and the class knife rigidity on the opposite side. Suppose if there is a, a right internal capsule lesion, they the left uh, segments or uh, uh, left side are involved. However, the uncrossed fibers that means those uh, fibers are the anterior corticospinal tract. They are reaching down the lane up to the same same level and they will have interaction on both sides. So they are almost the posture and equilibrium are spared because of their because if the right one is lost, the left one takes over. So that means that will be compensated. Whereas uh, the distal muscles, the distal muscles are from the lateral corticospinal tract. They produce the spasticity and the clasp knife rigidity on the opposite side. The tendon reflexes become exaggerated on the opposite side. If there is a right internal capsule lesion, the left side, left tendon reflexes are this thing. And the person would not be able to perform the fine movements because uh, the lateral corticospinal tract is uh, uh, necessary for the fine movements. So this is, uh, he is not able to perform the fine movements. Now, what happens to Babinski sign? Babinski sign become extensor or positive. The plantar response become extensor or Babinski sign becomes positive. Most possible causes of these type of lesions this is also known as a hemiplegia, hemiplegia, which happens because of the stroke or a hemorrhage, maybe middle cerebral artery that is involved in the internal capsule or the artery which is supplying the internal capsule. Cerebral palsy, some damages, subdural hemorrhage, the multiple sclerosis or trauma to the spinal cord. Because even if you cut the spinal cord, so the 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 corticospinal tracts coming from above are um, missing. So that means uh, the, the spinal cord injuries and the slip discs, all these are causes of the uh, lesions of the corticospinal tract. Now, what is a spasticity? Because I did mention about the spasticity here. A spasticity is a condition in which the muscles are stiff and tight. So these, these muscles, the persons with their spastic type of uh, uh, paralysis, he's stiff or this thing. And uh, he does not have the normal fluid motion or movement. So the, the mo movement is not very uh, smooth. So the muscles remain in a, a contracted state and they resist being stretched. Say, for example, you try to passively stretch it and you feel a lot of resistance by these in these, uh, these things. 
Now, there is one more interesting thing happens. This stretch is only at the initial level. Suppose if you try to force it, if you try to force it, the stretch gives away. That is the inverse stretch reflex. That means the Golgi tendon organs are activated and it gives away. So that means uh, uh, that is known as a clasp knife uh, rigidity. Clasp knife rigidity. Initially, they give enormous amount of stretch as it happens in case of the uh, clasp knife. And once you open up, it releases. So there is a release phenomena. The, uh, because of this uh, spasticity, the movements are affected. Because of the spasticity, the speech and the gait are hampered. The spastic gait is a classic gait, and the speech is also not spastic because he cannot have a smooth vocal cord accents. So thus, they will alter the speech and they will alter the gait of the individuals. And usually. This is associated with uh, the hypertonia. That means the tone of the muscle is increased. So now, in the other words, spasticity, here I have made spasticity is a condition in which muscles are stiff and tight, preventing normal fluid or a normal smooth action. Here, the spasticity is a motor disorder Characterized by velocity dependent increase in the tonic stretch reflexes, same thing, and exaggerated tendon reflexes. Now, so now I have already made here there is a hypertonia and exaggerated tendon reflexes, and a hyper excitability, excitability of the stretch reflex. That is uh, the another uh, definition for that. But I would uh, try to take this thing. It is a condition in which the muscles are stiff and tight. Preventing the normal fluid or a normal smooth movement associated with hypertonia, increased tendon reflexes, and they resist being stretched. And it is due to the involvement of extra pyramidal fibers. One point I would like to highlight here the loss of only pure pyramidal, uh, that means uh, the corticospinal tract originating from the um, the joint pyramidal cell layer. If they are cut, take one by one and cut them, you may not have that. But the internal capsule also destroys certain extra pyramidal fiber. So that is why the muscle tone and the gamma motor neuron activity is altered. In upper motor, this is called the upper motor neuron lesion. In upper motor neuron lesion, there is what is called a clasp knife rigidity, I mentioned. The clasp knife rigidity, there is an initial resistance to stretch. Suppose if I want to uh, bend or I want to bend this uh, joint, elbow joint, initially there is a stretch and suddenly it gives away. Or in the other way around also, whatever the way you look at. So there is an initial resistance followed by a release. And this is known as a clasp knife rigidity. And the release is due to the Golgi tendon organs and uh, the activation of the inverse stretch reflex. That means the inhibitory uh, activation of the inhibitory interneuron over the uh, alpha motor neuron. Now, this classic clasp knife rigidity is. Uh, this is a spasticity. So it is differentiated from a rigidity, rigidity of the uh, basal ganglia disorders, especially the Parkinsonism, where agonist and antagonist group of muscles are both are activated. So that means uh, even when you want to, when you want to stretch these muscles, uh, they both uh, the extensor group and the flexor group they are activated and they, they will give a uh, very tough resistance that is the uh, both uh, the it's a, it's a uh, strong rigidity it's a rigidity it does not yield or it does not release there is no release phenomena and uh, this type of rigidity is known as a uh, lead pipe rigidity or a cogwheel rigidity so that is where both agonist and antagonist group of muscles are activated. 
It is often associated with the basal ganglia disorders, especially this rigidity. Let us not worry about the rigidity. In upper motor neuron lesion, we have a clasp knife uh, phenomena or clasp knife rigidity. Now, Babinski sign, that is another important uh, uh, thing uh, which uh, becomes uh, positive in case of the upper motor neuron lesion. That is why uh, I repeat again here the Babinski sign. It is the scratching of the sole of the foot on the outer surface. So this scratch here and move it. So then this is because of the noxious stimulus. It's a scratching of the sole of the foot. And what it produces, uh, it involves these receptors and the centers involved are the lumbar five and the uh, sacral one segment. What is the response? In the normal individuals, the flexion of the toes, this toes here, and the ankle and knee in normal individuals. So this toes, you just see that there is all, all toe down flexion. You have this, uh, this is a normal uh, plantar response. It becomes extensor. This plantar respect reflex or Babinski sign becomes extensor or positive response. So what happens here? You just see that scratching. It, it the the toe great toe goes up, dorsiflexion, and you see these uh, uh, toes separate out. Here, these the 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 adduction of the toes. Uh, there is abduction of the toes, the fanning of the toes. So this is a positive plantar response or a positive Babinski sign. Now what happens if the nerve uh, to these uh, muscles are cut, that there is a nerve lesion, the sciatic nerve is cut or something is cut. So then what happens? Uh, you neither have the plantar response nor the extensor response. So that means it's upset. So now here plantar negative means it is a normal. Plantar positive or the Babinski sign positive means it is abnormal. It happens in case of upper motor neuron lesions, the conditions I mentioned earlier. But normally, the positive Babinski sign is seen in infants, and it can also be seen in a deep sleep, and in hypoglycemic states, hypoxic states, and in a deep anesthesia. You may find this Babinski sign may become positive. That is. Uh, uh, the about the, briefly about the Babinski sign. Now, what are the differences between the upper motor neuron lesion and lower motor neuron lesions? Now, this is one of the very frequently asked questions. That is why I have tabulated here. Uh, just uh, let us uh, see the upper motor neuron lesion and lower motor neuron lesion. The upper motor neuron lesion is above the spinal segment supraspinal the site of lesion is at the supraspinal and lower motor neuron is the the alpha motor neuron or the ventral horn cell neuron this is a ventral horn neuron or below or even the cutting of the ventral root or a nerve or whatever so this is a, this is a supraspinal above the spinal segment say for example if there is a lesion of the uh, thoracic level uh, t6 level now what happens, thoracic segment, at that segment, it would be lower motor neuron lesion. And below the level of the T6, that means T10, uh, T11, T12, so this would be upper motor. Okay, just giving you the spinal, uh, in the spinal cord lesions, I mentioned about that and I just revised. The type of paralysis, uh, spastic paralysis, in case of lower motor neuron, where the alpha motor neuron itself is damaged or destroyed, there is a flaccid paralysis, so there is no activity. So the muscles do not have a tone. Here, spastic, there is a hypertonic, and the spastic, a tight and a rigid type of these things. Uh, paralysis is spastic paralysis and the flaccid paralysis. Here, tone, hypertonia is present, there is a atonia. There is a spasticity and a clasp knife rigidity. That means a initial resistance followed by release. Here there is atonia, placid, no, no response. Deep tendon reflexes here are exaggerated. If you hit on the tendon reflexes, especially the patellar or any 
uh, ligaments. So then they are exaggerated. Deep tendons are uh, exaggerated. Here, the deep tendon reflexes are absent because uh, the one of the uh, component of the reflex arc is damaged. Babinski sign, it becomes positive because uh, positive means a uh, dorsiflexion and uh, the fanning of the toes. So that is a positive response. Whereas uh, in case of lower motor neuron lesion, one of the component of the reflex arc is uh, missing, they are absent. In, in, in other words, uh, when I'm talking about a plantar reflex, plantar reflex, we call it as extensor, either positive response or extensor response. The muscles, uh, uh, what happens to the muscle uh, nutrition that is wasting? So muscle wasting is absent here because there is uh, activity uh, coming from the alpha motor neuron. Alpha motor neurons are not altered. So that is why the muscles are not wasting. The muscle wasting is a resultant of the effect of a loss of a nerve growth factors reaching to the muscle. So, so but the nerve growth factors are uh, reaching to the neuromuscular junction and uh, keeping the muscle uh, in a, a contracted state or maybe they are hypertonic. Whereas in lower motor neuron lesion, uh, muscle wasting is present because uh, I, I mentioned about a nerve growth factor for the, uh, the muscle wasting. I don't think that uh, the, mus uh, the blood supply, it's not the blood supply, it is the nerve growth factor. Then because of the, uh, the cutting of the loss of the control on the skeletal muscles, the, there is a super sensitivity of these uh, muscle fibers. And uh, because of the super sensitivity, you get the uh, twitchings and fasciculations so in case of the lower motor neuron lesion. The twitchings and fasciculations are absent in upper motor neuron lesion because they are uh, not, not happening. There is no super sensitivity. So these upper motor neuron uh, lesions are produced by internal capsule lesions, the stroke, the multiple sclerosis, and uh, then uh, you can have the uh, spinal cord injuries. Uh, lower motor neuron lesion, the poliomyelitis, the amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, or a nerve injury, or a root injury, the dors, uh, ventral horn uh, or ventral root injury. So that is the difference. Now coming back here, I want to revise this thing again. Here is the course of the lateral corticospinal tract. I want to say it is from a four, six, eight, the S1, and somatosensory association area. Uh, this uh, blue one is the one descends. It is the internal capsule, and this is the part of the internal capsule. Come here, and in the medulla, make a pyramid, and then after that, uh, it uh, descends down, cross to the opposite side, descends 85% uh, or 80% or 85% cross to the opposite side, and supply the alpha motor neuron, uh, supplying the uh, muscle, the NJ horn neuron or the alpha motor neuron. And this would produce a, a precise action of the distal muscles. Then uh, that is uh, what I have written here, motor cortex, the premotor uh, cortex and the S1 and somatosensory area is the origin, the layer five, the joint pyramidal cell layer. Then they descend in the internal capsule in the posterior limb, posterior limb of the internal capsule and reach medulla and form the medullary pyramid and 85% cross to the opposite side and descend as a lateral corticospinal tract. And uh, they make a monosynaptic contact, that means a single fiber reaching up to the alpha motor neuron and uh, that would uh, activate those alpha motor neurons. So also the uh, via interneuron, it will supply the antagonist group of muscles uh, to have the balance of the activity and they supply the distal muscles and distal muscles of action. Now, in the other side, it is the ventral corticospinal tract or anterior corticospinal tract. Here, what happens, uh, this anterior corticospinal tract, again, the origin is same from the motor cortex or premotor cortex or S1 or SSK. So this one, brown, uh, brown one, brown fibers, it descends through the internal capsule, internal capsule reach medulla, okay, reach medulla here. Uh, but uh, 
already 80% of the fibers have crossed to the opposite side the the uncrossed fibers they descend down uncrossed fibers they descend down nearly they are 20% 15 to 20% and they reach the segmental level so this is the segment maybe whatever the segment they are designated to go and after reaching the segmental level they make a synaptic contact with through an interneuron this is an interneuron here and this interneuron would uh, would be supplying or uh, will be uh, activating the motor neurons of the this side and uh, this side. See, look at that. So they have a, a bilateral both sides. It is being activating, and then through an interneuron, uh, this uh, group of muscles are activated. And maybe it is not only one neuron. Maybe it involves uh, the gamma motor neurons. This involves the alpha motor neuron, this involves the gamma motor neurons, the gamma motor neuron which in turn uh, activate the 1A e, e fibers and then back to back to this uh, alpha motor neurons. That's the gamma, 1A and alpha loop. So now this is for proximal muscles or axial muscles for posture and these things. I mentioned that this uh, Ventral corticospinal tract. Suppose if there is a lesion here, this is internal capsule. Suppose if there is a lesion here in the internal capsule, so what happens? Though they descend out, so there is other group of fibers, they are coming up here and making a contact and the posture is regulated. It may not affect the posture. So that is the one of the applied aspect of these uh, these things. The at the sec so now come back here, uncrossed fibers descend as a ventral or a anterior corticospinal tract. They will reach the segmental level and make a contact, polysynaptic contact with the gamma motor neurons and bring about the actions. They are for posture and equilibrium and they supply the axial muscles. Axial muscles in the back muscles are the muscles which maintain the gravity and the posture. Now, these are the uh, reference books, um, maybe from the Candles Neuroscience, Guyton, and uh, the last two figures I have taken from uh, Genong's Review of Physiology and uh, I have certain uh, uh, aspects which I have taken from Samson Wright's Physiology. Now, uh, see, we just uh, I have given a number of questions here. Describe the origin, course, distribution, or actions of corticospinal tract. So that means you have to describe uh, uh, the entire uh, thing uh, which I have mentioned. I have given more information in the sense uh, the distribution, origin of the fibers, the internal capsule, because to highlight you and uh, to have the imagination of these things. Then comes the short notes, short notes on uh, spasticity, placid paralysis and spastic paralysis, something like upper motor neuron lesion and lower motor neuron lesion. That is the next question. Pyramidal tract, pyramidal tract, again, uh, you mentioned about what is that? Uh, this is a corticospinal tract, crossed, uncrossed. Babinski sign, I mentioned about that Babinski sign. The poliomyelitis, uh, it is the, the lower motor neuron lesion. Describe the lower motor neuron lesion because of the damage to the, or a destruction of the alpha motor neurons. The internal capsule lesions. You have to highlight all that twitchings and fasciculations because it is because of the super sensitivity. It is because of the super sensitivity. Cortical areas of origin. So I have mentioned various areas, just like M1, it is for precise action, premotor area, and uh, the parietal area for uh, the posture regulating, and uh, the supplementary motor area, the group of muscles, and uh, the uh, area uh, five and seven for uh, tool and uh, usage and um, the handling. The supplementary motor area, primary motor area, posterior parietal area, and functions of the ventral corticospinal tract. Now, in the next lecture, I will take about the parts, connections, circuitries, and functions of basal ganglia. Okay, uh, till then, thank you.